You're listening to Thunder Quack Podcast Network. This is the Thunder Quack Podcast. The official podcast of Thunder Quack Podcast Network. Where anything can happen. So strap yourselves in and hold on to your butts. It's Thunderquack time! Hello and welcome back to the Thunderquack podcast. I am one of your hosts, Michael Cohen. And I'm your other host, Amanda Conkin. And uh, this is going to be our episode ranking Star Wars Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith. Um, so we got through three we got through the, prequels. The prequels. We got through the prequels. Um, and uh, not to 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 spoil uh, the ending of this episode, but I mean, like, come on, this is <laughs> far and away the best of these three movies. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. There's not even a contest. That said, gonna have a lot of problems with this movie. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah. Um, it's a relative scale, right? Like, yeah. when you... I think one of the interesting things about this exercise is that I haven't sat and watched the prequels with a critical eye in a very long time. Mm. Um, most of the time, when I, when they're on, it's a uh, it's usually serendipitous, like they're right, on TV, like, right, or like, yeah. or I, or it's just like, oh, I'll just throw it in and do something else. Um, or I watched a video on YouTube that made me want to watch, like put on Attack of the Clones, not so that I can watch the movie, but just so that I can see that one scene with Obi Wan and Jango Fett staring yeah. each other down. Um, and the rest of the movie is just kind of incidental. <laughs> um, but with with these three viewings, it was like, no, we're gonna, we're gonna watch these movies. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, uh, they're rough. They're rough around the edges, but there's a reason for it. We'll get into that. Sorry, go ahead. I just, I think context matters a lot when you are watching stuff. And I was really excited for this one because I actually, I have a friend, Ryan, who's the host of the Riverdale Gang podcast. I haven't seen him in forever. And I happened to, on Sunday, be like, okay, I'm watching this relatively early in the day and I'm hungry. And who would watch Star Wars with me? And I texted Ryan and was like, hey, do you want to come over and eat Thai food and watch, uh, like, Revenge of the Sith? And he's like... Yeah, I do. Yeah. So he came over and we like, and he would like... Because even <laughs> though it's a bad movie, yeah. what else are you going to do? Yeah, yeah. Like, like if somebody says to you, do you want to come over to eat Thai food and watch Revenge of the Sith? Uh, no, I was going to fold laundry. Like, right, what yeah. are you going to... What else? Yeah. You, you got something better planned than but that? Because so that's a good just, afternoon. And it was just like a fun, like, thing where it, it lasted, like, the course of us having a meal. Yeah. And then talking about it a little bit as we were going through and he yeah. has such extensive knowledge of like m- like things that I would never sure. know about because of his like all the novelizations and yeah. all the stuff that he's got in his brain that it was just really interesting to get a little He and insights. I need to podcast about Star Wars at some oh, yeah. point because we've never like we've I mean Ryan and I have been in the same room yeah, on multiple occasions actually, yeah. but I don't think that he and I have ever had a real Star Wars conversation no. And that's that's yeah. that's a mistake. It would be that's, really fascinating. I yeah. would I would totally listen to that because you guys would both go into so different. Because yeah. I don't know how much canonical stuff he knows, like in the in the animated series, yeah. but all the books, like he grew up on those, right? Like yeah. so, just all like the. Whereas deep dive. I don't read. Yeah, as right. So it's knows. just it would just be like an interesting. <laughs> yeah. It would I think be an Thank interesting. Thank God for Audible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I have to say. Audible, though, I'm so mad. I just, it's such a waste of money for me. I pay for it every month. I I never listen to the books. Look, I got three credits sitting there right now, but I know that, so we had this conversation a little while ago, right? And the guilt from that conversation, I went back into Audible, and what I ended up doing, I crushed three books in a week. Oh, nice. So that's the thing is that, like, yeah, it's it's like a Netflix subscription where it's like, am I watching Netflix a lot right now? Well, I'm watching How I Met Your Mother and Friends every day. But I'm not... there. There isn't... Actually, that's not true. I, m- my next guest needs no introduction with David Letterman. Just dropped a new season. Mm-hmm. And so I have been devouring that because David Letterman is probably in, like, my top five oh. human beings of all time. Like, 
like uh, if you were to to ask like like who would you want to have dinner with it would be like i could never do everybody all at once each person needs their own dinner so <laughs> that's like my caveat but like george lucas is obviously there david letterman's up there as well he's in he's in like the probably the three people wow. that i would want to the most cuz david letterman we've talked about previously um saturday night live and and the the sad realization as a 34 year old man I'm never going to host Saturday Night Live. <laughs> it's not going to happen for me. I, I thought and when I was 20, that it would maybe be it was yeah, still yeah. possible. Um, there's a real, real outside chance that if I decide to start acting in my late 40s, 50s or 60s 50s, yeah. um, as a character actor, that maybe I'll get into the right comedy and maybe the mm-hmm. right thing will happen and, and, and I'll get the opportunity as an ironic host to get to host Saturday Night Live. Very, very outside mm-hmm. chance. Um, like a 0.00001% chance. Um, I will never get to be on The Late Show with David Letterman because it's done. And I'm never going to be on his Netflix show because that is like, that's not just like, oh, you're important enough to be interviewed on a talk show. That's like beyond, like the people who- no introduction. The people who are on that show are the people- who are above talk shows yeah. f- for yeah. a lot of them. It's like Seinfeld, Barack Obama. Like it's, Seinfeld just bothers me so much. Sure, but like he yeah, is I know, in but that Barack Obama, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, always be my maybe dropped on Netflix. I need to watch that. It but, is, but the problem great. with that is that I have to watch that with Crystal. Oh yeah, that's fair. So, it's, um, I I love is is one of there's lots of things I like. Would you I like to do an always be my maybe review? reviewed oh, for yeah grab somebody and record that and Definitely we will put it up on youtube okay. i'm going to france in yeah, two days true. <laughs> so uh but i'll just if you find time with any my... of the people that you're in yeah, france yeah, yeah, with, yeah to do a review to do it, it i'll let you know it doesn't I actually actually long. Can see if steph wants to do one with me we're there for the last day i'll see if maybe yeah. steph will and then we could talk about antsy and geek out about nerdy things you could are you guys flying back together no 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 but we could do it on the plane yeah, yeah. that would make that would be cool. um I yeah, guess. no, I mean, yeah. yeah, even if it's half an hour, it's but I'll see. content is content. <laughs> um, but it's it's worth a yeah. it's worth watching. I love that. I, love I bet I've heard a lot of really good things about it, yeah. so I, I want to check it out. They, sure. Like I say, Netflix nailing their rom coms, man. They do such a good Netflix job. Netflix is doing a lot yeah. of stuff really well. Actually, that's a perfect uh, segue into our news. But we have we have an email. An email. So let's read. The How email exciting! First. Uh, okay, uh, here's an email. Uh, you get you guys can email us as well at uh, thunderquackNetwork at gmail.com. You can also hit us up on Instagram, uh, Thunderquack Podcast, and on uh, Twitter at ThunderquackNet. Um, but uh, this is an email from Brad. Uh, and Brad says, Mike and Amanda, I adore the new Thunderquack pod. I've been a listener of Quiver since day one, and my favorite parts were always when you got off topic and spoke about <laughs> random pop culture stuff. I have one question for you guys to hopefully answer on the show. What do you guys collect and how do you decide what to collect? Mm -hmm. Myself, I collect one six scale comic based figures based on my favorite characters, Batman, Flash, Magneto, etc. As well as Funko Pops of anything my wife and I adore, but they are usually random characters. Goose, I think he means from Captain Marvel. Uh, Korg, Blue from Jurassic World. What would you consider your collection philosophy? Ooh. Thanks and stay sharp. And that's Brad Bell from Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, he's also got uh, his definitive Star Wars ranking. We'll talk about that at the at the end of oh, this, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. when we'll we do our that. ranking. I'll, I'll bring that up. Yeah. But yeah, so do you collect anything? Do you like go out of your way to collect anything? I don't go out of my way to collect stuff, but I have curated a very specific kind of collection. Okay. Like I have... Um, Superman things yeah. and Star Wars things. Like if I go to Funko Pops, like I ha I do like Funko Pops, but like very specific ones. Yeah. Um, my first ever Funko Pop was a Superman Funko mm-hmm. Pop. Um, but um, I used to. I think for me, curating a DVD collection was something that I did for yeah. a very long time. And so and like we and both like, used we to just, have like yeah, the wall. Wall, yeah. And I actually took when you got over your DVD collection. Yeah. I took your like. Um, the TV unit. TV that unit that had the the shelf underneath it, and I still have all my TV shows that I don't think yeah. I'm gonna get rid of. But um, I've started. It's it, it might not. It seems like a weird correlation, and I'm trying to like be less. Um, uh, I guess like putting geekdom in a box, 
But this year I've started curating my book collection in a way that mm -hmm. I haven't previously. Like I just sort of was like, oh, books, I'll just read them when I read them. But now I'm like, oh no, I want a library. So yeah. my new thing is to actually like, I have books and I've been putting them very intentionally in places so that I can like, that's my shift this year. I'm like almost done my reading challenge for the year. I'm so excited. I'm going to try to hit 50 books this year, but I am almost to 35. Actually, I've passed it. There's some books I don't count because they're garbage books, but technically I have read more than 35 books. Um, but I don't, so I don't know if that counts, but really the, the stuff is like, I have little things like I'll, Harry Potter and I'm going to, I'm going to suggest that you do actually have a collect, like a very specific collection and there's a methodology to this collection. You have a very, very extensive collection of geeky earrings. Oh yeah. Very extensive. I do. In fact, you have geeky earrings for basically any geek occasion yeah so like when you came over to watch attack of the clones last week yeah. you wore your lightsaber earrings yeah. although you lost one of them I did. did you I'm find so, it no i'm devastated it's not here yeah so okay well it falls off all the time it was bound to happen yeah, yeah. but i have my yodas that i can replace it with but so. here's the thing even though you lost one it just means you get to buy new ones. i know and so. it actually makes me really happy because also I'm going to Annecy and they're gonna have stuff there, there like you know. um like uh. But you've got like you've people, got yeah. Millennium Falcon earrings, right? Yeah. You have Tardis earrings. Yeah, I've a couple pairs of Tardis earrings. Yeah. Um, I have actually earrings that I just bought at a convention that look like the birds from Twitter, like tweet earrings. Okay. Which is kind of cool. Yeah. Um, I have um uh what are they? The Time Turners. I have Time Turner earrings yeah. from Harry Potter. Um, I have. I like I collect accessories as well that go with that. So like yeah. scarves, yeah. like I have some geeky like geeky scarves, like so I can wear my Star Wars stuff. But I have a couple different. I might need to. Yeah. Anyways, I do. Yes, you're right. Actually, that's something very specific that I yeah. very actively curate. I have some uh, How to Train Your Dragon, like the um uh the night oh what's night fury uh yeah night fury ones and yeah I like my I like my earring collection yeah. and um. Oh, from Attack on Titan, the um, m m the girl with the swords. I haven't watched Attack on Titan in forever. I don't know. I don't watch Attack on Titan. Those things creep me out. Oh, it does. I mean, it but is kind of. I know, I know that's yeah. the point, but yeah. like, it they're too ugly for me. Oh, I don't want that. I don't want that in my life. Yeah. I uh, yeah. I collect way too many things. Yes, you um, do. Let's see. Probably at the top of my list is I. Uh, uh, graphic novels um trade paperbacks um is that what this box is right here beside me those are comic book issues those ones are actually ones that i'm getting rid of um is that a trade paperback a trade paperback is a collected edition <gasps> oh right yeah like the so, stuff yeah um the most notable things in my collection would be i uh, i've got both volumes of telos colossal which i that's kind of a very niche thing um I have I uh, both versions of Scott Pilgrim. So I have I have the original printings of it. Um not first editions, but um a couple of them are actually first edition. I think the last two volumes are first edition, but um the like the regular black and white as they were originally released, and then I have the hardcover color editions. Um and one day I'll probably go out of my way to get the the um if I ever see the whole collection I can buy it all at once. I'll probably get the um, the Evil X's version because oh, yeah. they did the regular colored hardcover versions, and then they did a, like exclusive um, uh, editions of those that uh, that had each one was the Evil X on the on the cover. I'm going like one of the biggest things in Annecy is like comic books. Yeah. Do you want me to keep an eye out for you for no, like the, um, it's, it's one it's of like those things that I'll have to yeah, I'll give myself an eye and I have to kind yeah. of got the, I have to have the money kind of aside. Right, yeah, that's right. Um, I, and the price has to be right and all that right, sort of yeah. thing. Um, and then I've got, um, I've got the deluxe hardcover editions of why the last man, um, Brian K. Vaughn being my favorite comic book writer. <laughs> I know him. He did fables, right? Uh, no? no, he didn't do Fables. Um, Who did that one? No, he did Runaways. Oh, that one. Oh, yeah. yeah. I recognize it from yeah. us. He did Runaways and Why the Last Man. He did a bunch of stuff. I mean, Saga is also Brian K. Vaughn. Um, oh, maybe that's why. I've just read more Brian K. Vaughn than yeah. anything else because those are the two. Um, and then I... I huh, I mean, like, there's so much in my collection, but the thing I think that's probably the most prominent right now, the thing that I just finished collecting is the Ultimate Editions of the Invincible hardcovers. Mm -hmm. Invincible 
went from uh, a comic that I knew nothing about to a comic that I kept hearing about, particularly from Greg Miller from Kind of Funny. And uh, he insisted on, that people would read it. And he's a big Superman fan. He like it, basically pitched it as like Superman butt. Um, and uh, and then we eventually read it on Pullbox Podcast. Superman butt what? Like it's Superman butt. These things are different. Oh, okay, so, cool. Um, he's a kid. Like his dad is Superman, but then it turns out that he's actually it's complicated. Yeah, and I, I don't want to. No, that's fine. I wouldn't want to ruin Superman the first one. That's fine. That's fine. Um, and I, I, it went from being a series that I was really enjoying to a series that I couldn't get enough of. And then I finished it and it has an ending, like it has a definitive ending to the series. Um, and the ending is so good that Invincible, this is probably like the first time that I'm saying it publicly, like Invincible is my favorite comic book series of all time right now. Like, nice. and, and like, like definitively, like not even... There's not even like a like a it's, well, but this is better in this way. No, like Invincible from start to finish is a phenomenal piece of work, and that's uh, Robert Kirkman who also did The Walking Dead. Um, and I think like as good as The Walking Dead is, it meanders and goes off into weird territory. Um, Invincible is so good from start to finish, nice. and and it finishes so strong um, that that's kind of right now that's kind of the the crown jewel of my of my comic book collection because it is their oversized hardcover uh versions um and it's and i've got all 12 of them and then they're all in good condition so um yeah when when actually probably this weekend when i pull a lot of this junk out of this room and uh and, and start putting things on the shelves um invincible will have a have a very specific place um in this room the other thing that i have discovered that i collect over the last few years is lego yeah you're that's uh, so much of that yeah it just it went again like lego is something that i've always loved since i was a, a little kid like as like i don't remember not loving lego um but it it made a shift a couple of years ago to where um, this was actually very similar to the Obi Wan Kenobi thing for me, where um, I was always like, "Oh, who's your favorite Star Wars character?" It's a tie between Han Solo and Obi Wan Kenobi. Yeah. And then one day I looked at my collection, I looked at at my statues, my Star Wars statues, and it was like they're all Obi Wan Kenobi, and I don't have a single Han Solo statue. Yeah. I don't think I can say. That, that it's a tie anymore. Obi Wan Kenobi is my favorite Star Wars character, um, and I think that at a certain point with Lego, it was like, oh, I don't. Ju this isn't just a hobby. Yeah. I collect Lego sets. Yeah. Um, and I think that I think the place where it turned for me was when they did the Ninja Turtles stuff from the 2012 series. Um, I bought every set in because I because. At first it was, well, I have to get all of these sets in order to have a full set of all four Turtles, plus April, plus Splinter, plus the Shredder, right? So I wanted to make sure that I had that. And then it was like, well, I also want to have the two main henchmen, um, I, I, what are their names? Dog Meat and Fish Face, I think? I would, uh, could Ninja, not have, no, I'm just talking about Yeah, I could not. I, Ninja Turtles. I... And then at a certain point I looked at it and I was like, well, if I buy these two more sets, then I have every set from wave one of the Lego Ninja Turtles stuff. And then they, they did a wave two. I didn't, I think I maybe got one of the wave twos, um, but I didn't really like any of the sets in wave two. So I didn't, didn't collect those. And then they lost the license. Lego lost the license oh, and it went geez. to Mega Blocks. Oh man. So now it's one of those things where like I was going through stuff, organizing Lego, taking stuff down, putting it all in. I actually posted this on Instagram. So you can go look at my Instagram and see that I organized everything. I broke down a bunch of the sets, not all the way broken down, but broken down so that I could flat pack them basically in Ziploc bags in freezer bags that like the heavy duty ones. Yeah. Um, and filled up two Rubbermaid containers. And not not little Rubbermaid containers. Like, like those the deep big, ones. deep ones, yeah. I filled up two with Lego sets and said to Crystal, like, I 
this is sort of a I think in, this is this is something that collectors need to learn to do. You take things down, you put them away, and then you forget about them. And then when you open up a box, it's like the spark joy thing, basically, oh, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. but for collectors, because collectors, yeah. it's a little bit different. Like it's a, there's a need and yeah. it's sparking joy is a little bit more complex, um, than just getting rid of your stuff. Um, if you open it up and you forgot that you had it and you're delighted to see it again, don't get rid of it. Oh, yeah. You keep that. Yeah. If you open it up and you go, oh yeah forgot i had that right yeah yeah it's time to go yeah so i said to crystal like, what I'm you're supposed all... to do with clothes too yeah you're i'm supposed... gonna put all these away and uh and and the next time that i go into this like when we move or whatever or, or i end up with m- more space to put stuff up um when i go through this again and look at it and go like oh i totally forgot that i even had that that's the point where I break it down into the pieces and I put it up on eBay with the instruction. Cause I keep the instruction manuals for everything. Um, I put it up on eBay as a complete thing and, nice. and, uh, yeah. and get rid of it. Um, yeah. So I don't know. I'm kind of at the phase of my life where I'm trying to figure out, I mean, like I've got a bucket over here full of lightsabers and nerf weapons. Yeah. <laughs> That's um, great. and uh, a lot of it's got to go. A lot of it just has to go. Like, like, when's the last time that I played with a Nerf gun? When I bought it, and then I put it in that bucket. Yeah. Like, like, yeah. um, and it's, there, and it'll hard. come back yeah. around because it'll come it'll, eventually. Kara and and the next kid will be old enough to want to play with this stuff, um, and to be responsible enough to play with this stuff. Mm-hmm. That uh, that I'll be like, let's bust out the Nerf guns and yeah. and have a Nerf war or whatever. But, um. But they're always making more Nerf guns. I don't need these ones. That's the hard. That was the hardest thing when I realized I have this cost, like these costumes. Yeah. Because when I used to be in theater, it used to be really useful to just have stuff. But I'm yeah. like, it's now more economical for me to just buy a new thirty dollar something yeah. than for me to store this stuff that is just taking up space. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah. So I mean, like, I think that's part of growing up. But I that's think that, terrible. I hate it. I think collecting is. It, Collecting is a thing that, that gets attributed to geeks and is like, a, it's oh, not. geeks it's are, and it's like awesome. everybody yeah. collects something. Yeah. Everybody yeah. collects yeah. something. Exactly. Even if you're a minimalist, you yeah. collect nothing. Yeah. Like, That's it's what like a you thing collect. where you like curate that in your Because mind. a collection is a thing that you do, that mm-hmm. you accumulate, that you, that is tied to your identity. Yeah. And, and, and like I said, like if you're a minimalist, you're, the thing that you're accumulating is space. It's nothingness. Yeah. Yeah. And that's part of your identity and you take pride in it. It's like, I take pride in my Disney infinity figure collection. I've got all of the star Wars figures from Disney infinity and I love that stuff. And if they were still doing Disney infinity, I would still be buying them because they're, they were such a great series of things. The Marie Kondo did support people's, uh, collections she says she, if, it, okay. if it sparks joy for you yeah. just have it in, in with intention in a yeah. space right yeah. which is like I like that, that was part of the that was part of the purpose of this room and, and when it when it is done which i think it'll mm-hmm. it'll get done over the course of the summer yeah. when it is done i think that'll be really obvious that that it's about I mean, it's not about it being a man cave because i hate that mm-hmm. it's it was more about my collection having its own its own space right yeah um, rather than being just kind of, cause right now it's, it's cluttering the rest of the house mm-hmm. and, and at a point when I didn't have the disposable income that I've had over the last few years, that was manageable and it was okay. And it was like, Oh, cool. little figure here. And it's like, people would walk in and they'd look around and they'd see stuff. Now I look around and I go like, it's just out of control. Yeah. Um, so I got to get rid of stuff and I have to pack stuff away and I have to organize things a little bit better, but that's the purpose of this room. This room will be the room that people can walk in and go, oh, that's, just oh, that's yeah. cool. Yeah. And then I can go back to hiding things Yeah. in the rest of the house yeah. where you're looking through and you're like, is is Darkwing Duck next to that picture frame? Yeah. yeah. It's like, yeah, like cool stuff like yeah. that, like Easter eggs in the house. Yeah. Um, cool. Do you want to get into the news? Yeah. Thank you, you for the email, Brad. That's um, great. That's actually a really good conversation. Yeah. I never really thought about it before. Yeah. No, that was awesome. Yes. Um, first piece of news, we were talking about Netflix earlier, uh, and they've got it figured out and they're doing a Magic the Gathering series. Uh, I believe it's going to be animated. Yeah, Yeah. I think so. Um, 
and it's being produced uh, by the the Russos, Joe and Anthony Russo, who you would know as the directors of Endgame, Infinity War, yeah. Civil War. Um, so I mean, like, there that's that's a great cool. combination. Yeah. Yeah. Magic: The Gathering has an incredible lore. Um, there are books and all sorts of See, things. See, I don't know that much about it. It's the, it's the card game, though, it's right? It's the card game. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, Which, like, how is that not adapted yet? Like, that's, it's, that's it's, really cool. It's something that I think they've been trying to figure out for a while. Right, and yeah. it's been a matter of getting the right people together. Right, yeah. Um, and I think that this is, these these are the right guys. I think that they can yes. be trusted with an epic story yeah. um, uh, yeah. that's character-focused. And I think it'll... My hope is that it adds value to magic as a as a property because yeah. right now it's like there are people who do know the Being stories of these Fortnite. characters. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, but uh, but I think the majority of people who play magic they don't even the, a lot of people don't even really understand the concept of the game mechanics in magic, which is that there are people called planeswalkers and the planeswalkers tap into different types of magic, the different the different mana pools to uh, essentially bring in monsters from other planes. Uh, and uh, I mean, like, that lore is just ripe for the picking. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and the Planeswalkers themselves, there are characters, and uh, I, they're cool characters. I mean, like, there's one dude who's just this big lion, <laughs> knight, magic user guy. That's cool. And, uh, and that's cool. Like, there's just yeah. cool stuff, and I think it's great for an animated format. I think they'll take it seriously, and that's the most important part. Is is um, with something it that high concept, you need to yeah. Like... It's not. I it. I think the really important thing here is that it's. It, I don't think this will be a show about playing magic. Yeah, no. I think it will you. be about these characters in this world, um, and it'll add an extra dimension to the mechanics of the game when you're playing it to see yeah. this is what i'm doing as opposed to something like Yu Gi Oh, which is a show based around the card game itself right um or even pokemon which again is a show based around the video game right, yeah. the video game came first and then the show is just a commercial essentially yeah. i don't think that's what this will be i think this will be really digging into that lore so because they're realizing exciting. what actually works and what audiences are really being drawn to and like yeah it's it's pretty cool yeah is and the witcher series coming to netflix or is that gonna be somewhere uh else? no the witcher is netflix yeah because yeah. i'm excited for that one too which that one's gonna like, be good that's gonna be like so coming good. sometime soon but was just talking about them taking like yeah. like lore series for yeah. like um really seriously like i'm really excited for yeah that. um yeah, I, I also on Netflix uh, coming next year is Jurassic World Camp Cretaceous, mm-hmm. an animated series set in the world of uh, the time period of Jurassic World. Um, essentially, it's a group of teenagers. I think there's like six or eight of them or something that are part of a, a, an exclusive um, internship slash summer camp at Jurassic World. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, on the other side of the island from the resort, and Jurassic World happens, and everybody kind of forgets about them. <laughs> um, and, uh, like, I... This is going to be awesome. It's going to yeah, be great. Yeah, so, yeah. when Jurassic World happened, and, like, it, it'll, it'll pop up, actually, probably pretty soon in my Facebook memories, mm-hmm. I posted a thing saying, like... Jurassic World is great and everything, but what I really want is a, is a TV series that takes place at Jurassic World with the people who work at Jurassic World. <laughs> like like the OC yeah. meets like Disneyland, You're essentially. Yeah, of like yeah, like yeah, these yeah. teenagers and young adults yeah. working at Jurassic World and falling in love and what because yeah. it would be because like you're it, it's it is fun. the summer just, camp yeah. sort of it's like yeah. you're working on this island you probably live on the island while yeah. you work there right like the, like it's the yeah the barracks thing. for where everybody lives would it's, just be like a fun yeah like, I mean like yeah it would just be like who's sleeping with who yeah, right yeah, like yeah. It, it like I thought like this is so so perfect for a teen drama um they're going a slightly different <laughs> route with it but but I, I mean like really honestly same concept just yeah. different audience right they yeah. just they're just gearing it down towards yeah. the the 8 to 13 yeah. age range um but still like conceptually 
that's what I want. I want to live in that world. I don't want to just visit it, right? Yeah. And when we go to Jurassic Park movies, you're a temporary visitor to the world of dinosaurs brought back to life through genetic engineering, right? right yeah. And this is their opportunity to dig in and get an episode that focuses on a specific species of dinosaur, right? And um, you know that they're going to have dinosaur friends and you know that like if they're stuck on the island, this is going to be a survival type thing, but it's a cartoon on Netflix. It'll be kid oriented. Yeah. So there's going to be like a Swiss family Robinson Tarzan yeah, type kind of, of vibe. vibe to this um, land of the lost, like all of that. And, uh, and the animation, the, the teaser that they put out this morning... Looks really cool. Looks yeah. fantastic. Like, the yeah. quality of the animation looks phenomenal. Yeah. It's DreamWorks, and they've... DreamWorks has done some really, really good stuff in the last few years. Um, the the Arcadia Trilogy stuff, uh, with Trolls, and Three Below, and, and uh, there's a new series, I can't remember what it's called, but... Um, and uh boss baby oh yeah <laughs> surprisingly great yeah super yeah. super good all of the how to train your dragon stuff has been really yeah. really good um yeah They're Dream, good. They're dreamworks good, animation yeah. does really really great stuff yeah. um so yeah uh and then the last piece of news uh from this last week is that a new lion king teaser dropped um we'll get to hear beyonce Knowles as nala for the first time uh and i uh, get a little bit more of sort of the the lion king vibe uh, as opposed to just sort of like a lot of what we've gotten so far is the first 30 seconds of lion king yeah 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 yeah. the circle of life stuff yeah and uh and it's nice to see some of that other stuff coming in Mm -hmm. but we still haven't gotten to see the piece that's the most important to me which is like i want to make sure that this movie is going to do the musical numbers in the way that the musical numbers deserve to be done Mm -hmm. like aladdin did justice to uh friend like me and king uh, prince ali like like those numbers were i think better than they were in the animated version like what else would they do though like they have to do a similar thing in the lion king but like so when you look at everything they've released so far it's all so um like some like real or yeah like it's so real and and just can't wait to be king is it's like not a, yeah. it's like a neon broadway musical <laughs> with jungle animals right and hakuna matata similarly like has some really really great visual moments in it we saw a little bit of that in the last trailer where we see we see uh simba grow up um but i think that they're like they they have like that's the thing the Lion King as a musical was way more popular on Broadway than Aladdin as a musical. They know that the musical numbers, I think they're saving it because they know how great they are. I hope so. Like, I think that I, that's, I, like, Disney knows what they're yeah, doing. Like, they did that with Aladdin as well, right? Yeah. They didn't show us a lot until they showed us a lot. Yeah. Um, and that's, that is my hope. Yeah. But the, the problem with Lion King is that Jungle Book was also directed by Jon Favreau. And although it has musical numbers in it, and the musical numbers are great, and the musical numbers in Jungle Book are a little bit more toned down as well. They're kind of more in... I hate the musical the in... Yeah, the Jungle Book music is not Oh, my, you don't like it? Oh, I, Bare Necessities is one of okay, the greatest fine. songs of all time. Bare Necessities is really fun. Um, generally, yeah. I just... I don't like the Jungle Book generally. Yeah, so, okay. Jungle sorry. Book's one of my favorites. Oh, so, okay. Well, there you go. Um, yeah, and I like what Jon Favreau did with Jungle Book, but... I hope that Lion King has a little bit more of its original flavor. Mm. That said, I also want it to do things that the original didn't do. Um, Because that's what Aladdin did. Aladdin did some stuff that the original didn't do. Have you seen it yet? No. No? You need to go see it. It's so good. I know. Um, And the stuff that it did, the extra stuff that it did, was phenomenal. So, um, yeah. Cool. You want to talk about Revenge of the Sith? Right. That's what we're here to talk about? Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, so, I don't know what else to... Uh, the well, name... Okay, I have to say. It might be the best of the three prequels, but the name is the most forgettable. I have to say how many times I had to struggle to like remember which one this was called. Attack of the Clones is the most viscerally rememberable. You think and, so? And so I always would refer to it as Attack of the Clones, and I was like, that's a completely different movie. Yeah. But, it meant, but also, Revenge of the Sith is confusing because I don't know what it's referring to. Is it about Anakin? Or is it about... 
the Revenge of the Sith is referring to the fact that thousands of years ago, uh, the Jedi exterminated the Sith. So in the Star Wars lore, uh, and and obviously this is uh, legend stuff that is yet to be reconfirmed as canon, um, but I, I, even the Clone Wars kind of implies a lot of this stuff. Thousands and thousands of years ago, like genera- thousands of generations ago, the, the Sith were essentially an order of the same magnitude as the Jedi. And... Um, the Sith are after power and control and blah, blah, all that stuff. So they attacked the Republic and attempted to exterminate the Jedi. And a war raged for years and years and years. And eventually the Jedi, I think along with the, like alongside the Mandalorians, defeated the Sith. And over, over generations... Uh, the the as they tried to regain power, they could never they kind of never get back going because the problem with a Sith is that you're when you're always craving power, your master is always the person more powerful than you, uh-huh, yeah. and to become the most powerful Sith, you kill your master. Right, so yeah. they could never really like gain a foothold, right, and then yeah. Darth Bane, um, I think it was Darth Bane instituted the rule of two. Mm-hmm. Which is that there's a, that there are only ever two Sith, the a master and an apprentice, and that's how the Sith would survive. Oh, because then they wouldn't get to until yeah, yeah. the time was right when they would reveal themselves to the Jedi Interesting. and take over the galaxy. And other Sith had ideas. Uh, Darth Plagueis being being the one that precedes Palpatine. Um. Of course, until until he dies, until Palpatine kills him, <laughs> um, and and takes over as as Darth Sidious as the Dark Lord of the Sith, and uh, and then enacts his plan for his revenge against the Jedi for exterminating or almost exterminating the Sith. So that's what the title is referring to. This whole plan was the revenge of the Sith. It's the firing of Chekhov's gun that was loaded in the Phantom Menace right. when when Darth Maul says at last we will reveal ourselves, we will reveal Jedi, ourselves. Yeah. we'll have our revenge right. so that's what it is it's also a mirror of Return of the Jedi right, yeah. so Return of the Jedi Revenge of the Sith Rise of Skywalker yeah. Rise of the Skywalker would have been a little bit more mm-hmm. but it's R of blank mm-hmm. um, so yeah like the the three conclusions to the three trilogies are yeah. uh revenge return rise whoa yeah cool which is why i say this uh, the uh, rise of skywalker has nothing to do with a skywalker yeah no rise it's, of it's, skywalker is rise of the new jedi yeah that's what it yeah where they could just like call themselves something completely different yeah. that's both light and dark and ray and kylo rule them all no <laughs> Come on. i Fine. Ray is Skywalker in that yeah, title. Yeah, I'm yeah. I'm fairly sure that yeah, Ray is yeah, yeah. Skywalker in that title. Yeah. But um, I had to watch I had to watch um Force Awakens immediately I after yeah. <laughs> I watched. You tweeted about it. Um <laughs> or Instagrammed about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um Yeah. Revenge of the Sith is tough. It's got a lot of the same problems as the other two prequels. But thankfully, it's more interesting. There's a lot more fighting. It's a lot more. Yeah, there's, there's a, lot a lot more, more battle. Yeah, but well, maybe too much battle. Unfortunately, but, yeah. yeah, like they lean into the battle aspect of it mm-hmm. a little bit too much. It kind of overcompensates for the other two movies. Yeah. Um, that opening flying through the spaceships, it could have been half half as much as what it was. Like, and it was so established. there was a lot of stuff in Revenge of the Sith that George Lucas did because he could. Right, yeah. Not because he should or because it served the story. So the opening is a really great, um, a, a really great example of that. All of those ships, the length of the opening shot was all to show off, really. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's great. It's really well done. It's it's really well choreographed. Um, it's a it's a I mean. Watching it at home is very different from watching it on the big screen. I remember seeing that on the big screen and it being just this amazing 
experience on the big screen. Um, and and that sequence holds up, but there's a lot of this movie that visually doesn't hold up. Mm. There are a lot of scenes that are very clearly on green screen that they went, well, we'll figure out where this is taking place later. <laughs> One of them being the conversation between uh, Anakin and Palpatine. No. Um, when uh, Palpatine is telling him that he's going to appoint him to the Jedi Council. Oh, yeah, that hallway or whatever? Uh, yeah, so they so they go through that hallway a couple of times in the movie, and that's the first time that we see it. And we see that freeze on the, on the back wall, which is actually a freeze depicting the battle between the Jedi and the Sith, <laughs> which I think, which uh, Palpatine had installed uh, in the time that he was Supreme Chancellor. And I think that the Jedi would have looked at that and gone like, he really does respect the Jedi. Like this is, <laughs> but it's one of those things where it's almost like if you like flip it upside down. Yeah, yeah, it's um, like the yeah. It's like the it's like what Zack Snyder tried to do in uh, uh, Batman v Superman with the angel and <laughs> yeah, demon, demon painting. Thing in the, yeah, but, that's the, with the. But yeah. he was like so on the nose with it, where yeah, at the end of the movie it's flipped it upside down. Yeah. And you're like Lex Luthor has become evil. Right. It's like, um. He was evil at the beginning of the movie. <laughs> yeah, Nothing yeah. changed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He yeah. didn't. That character didn't have an arc. He just <laughs> yeah. then did the thing he said yeah. he was going to do at the beginning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He had done it and got caught. That's it, it's, it's. Does getting caught make you evil? <laughs> um, no, he was evil the whole time. Um, but yeah, it is this idea of like like Palpatine has this thing in his office that is this massive hint that he is Darth Sidious. Uh, yeah, yeah. um, that if you were paying attention you would have noticed a long time ago, but that I think they probably like wrote off as like Palpatine really respects the Jedi because he's like got this beautiful piece of art that he commissioned depicting the triumph of the Jedi over the Sith. But what it actually is, is his reminder to revenge of, yeah. of why he's doing what he's yeah. doing. Um, and I, I like, I, I, there are so many details like that in star Wars that I love. And that, that, piece is a real physical thing that was made um and such a beautiful piece of art like this 3d uh sculpture painting right that uh, that depicts this this epic moment in star wars history that hopefully we're gonna get to see in uh the the benioff and weiss star wars movies if they end up doing the old republic stuff oh yeah, yeah that's yeah, what yeah. people expect that they're doing because game of thrones old republic it makes sense for them to go back to the beginning of the jedi knights and blah, blah, blah. but but it like that scene the first part of that scene is that the room that they're in is cg and <laughs> you can tell that that room is cg now you mm. couldn't at the time it was very so. convincing at the time but now i look at it and i'm like some of those surfaces are just a little bit too clean <laughs> right um yeah a little bit too shiny and it's just so artificial nobody ever touches anything yeah, nobody ever so. interacts with their environment people just walk well through and that's, hallways that's the thing to watch revenge of the sith and then immediately watch the force awakens yeah one of the best scenes in the force awakens is when Rey's making herself the bread stuff. Yeah. Like, that just rises. Like, it's such a beautiful, practical thing. And it's, and, and it, like, that's the blue milk, right? Yeah. We'll talk about this when we come back in a couple yeah. of weeks, when we talk about A New Hope. Like, the thing that made Star Wars amazing to the audience was that before that, we had two things. You had Flash Gordon, which was, like, shiny spaceships, and mm -hmm. ridiculous aliens with green antenna and whatever. Mm -hmm. um, like that, like the sort of Mars attacks, yeah. ridiculous sci-fi stuff. And then you had the hyper-realistic, boring 2001 A Space Odyssey. Which right. I love 2001 A Space Odyssey, but it is a boring movie. Mm -hmm. it's, it's intentionally a boring movie. Um, it's sort it's mundane, right? Like, and that's the idea is that space travel in, in that version of the future in that version of 2001 was mundane mm -hmm. until the point that all of a sudden, you know, God starts talking to them um, and taking I've over their robot. Seen. That's fine. You're not missing much. Okay. I, I mean like you are, but yeah, it's, you're it's, not it's, missing it's much because of me. It's a person me. might yeah. be missing a lot, yeah, but, but me, I'm fine. I don't yeah. think you're going to get that yeah. much of it. Um, but yeah, that tactile. But yeah. Star Wars, A New Hope, like it, it was like, let's start the movie in space, spaceships, stormtroopers, lasers, Darth Vader, R2D2, C3PO, 
and then crash onto Tatooine and everything's dirty and it's lived in and you see Luke and he lives in this little hut underground Mm -hmm. in the desert and uh, and he's sitting at dinner with his aunt and his uncle that he lives with and his aunt pours him a glass of milk for dinner and it's like it's so relatable and real and that's what makes Star Wars different from Star Trek or Flash Gordon or 2001 is that 2001 wasn't relatable because it was so polished and so kind of like out there in a lot of it and so like esoteric almost um and and the Flash Gordon stuff is like stupid and and right? yeah and just flashy and by and, design yeah. right yeah. like yeah. like I say stupid in a very respectful way like yeah. it's let's run around with lasers and shoot each other right yeah. like and fight good guys fighting bad guys Star Wars takes those two worlds and blends them together and that's what makes Star Wars Star Wars. And every once in a while in the prequels, they try and capture that again, like in Dex's Diner or um, I, the the meal in I, the Skywalker hovel and Phantom Menace. Oh, yeah. But, yeah then, but, it's like... but then George Lucas ruins it with Jar Jar shooting his tongue out repeatedly. Right, and like, yeah, like, like that, making it, yeah. that moment serves a purpose because then Qui-Gon the grabs his tongue and he's like, oh, your reflexes, blah, blah, blah. But... It's just, there are so many things in these movies to just take you out of mm-hmm. the the veritas that Star Wars is supposed to have. And that's the one thing that the, the sequels have nailed, is that, like, the practical effects and the... Um, the reality of the situations for a lot of the characters yeah, is so like grounds yeah. it in yeah. the way that Star Wars needs to be grounded that mm-hmm. the prequels just don't have. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. the um the biggest thing for watching it again is like there's all the bigger level things that you can pull apart, but always it's always bothered me that like Padme just dies. Like that's the thing where it's like yeah. she just. Do you want the explanation? Well, I mean. It's not, yes. it's, 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 it, this isn't, this is a defense of the story, not a defense of the movie. Mm-hmm. So from a story perspective, it works. In the movie, it's not explained. Metachlorians are set up in the Phantom Menace. Yes. Anakin was created by the Metachlorians. Yes. The Metachlorians manipulated Shmi Skywalker's body yeah. to create life. Yeah. Right? Um... Anakin Skywalker has the highest concentration of any Jedi ever known. Mm-hmm. There are all of these microscopic creatures in his blood that are connected to the Force. Mm-hmm. If you extrapolate that and say uh, his connection to the Force, which we know based on Luke's connection to Leia, mm-hmm. Luke's connection to Vader, Vader's connection to both of them, there's a familial bond with those midichlorians. The they're, the midichlorians are also genetically linked to one another, not just not just the, the family bond of genetics, but like the midichlorians themselves. Those microscopic life forms are descendants of the other Anakin's, okay. right? Cool. Anakin gets Padme pregnant. Padme is a, a human with a low concentration of midichlorians, probably almost like a nominal amount, right? Yeah. Like yeah. like she can't use the force. Yeah. Right, she can't tap into it. Maybe, yeah. maybe the force manipulates her. She does Whatever, every once yeah. in a while. Han Solo definitely has a probably an above average. Mm-hmm. So does Poe Dameron. Like that's how they're able to do the stuff that they do. That's why they're the greatest pilots in the galaxy. Blah blah blah. Right. It, it's all kind of like you extrapolate all this, and it mm-hmm. all kind of makes sense. Padme doesn't have midichlorians in her body naturally, but now she's got genetic material from Anakin Skywalker replicating in her body metachlorians in the bloodstream Mm -hmm. of two children Mm -hmm. in her body at the same time her circulatory system is sharing blood with these two new entities yes and those two new entities are producing metachlorians at like phenomenally high rates Mm -hmm. because luke and leia also way higher concentrations we don't know that for sure because it's never confirmed in anything but thank god (laughs) obviously but yes yeah so padme's body in that time 
is connected to the Force in the way that it's not physically ready for. Mm. And those midichlorians are, like, let's say, like, quantumly entangled with Anakin, right? Anakin, in the Force, goes through a metamorphosis. He right. ceases to become Anakin Skywalker, to be Anakin Skywalker and becomes Darth Vader. Yeah. His body physically changes in that process. Yeah, that's true. Right? He, he, his, his features become, mm-hmm. like, uh, sunken and... And, like, it, it has a physical effect. We see that physical effect to the nth degree on Palpatine in his fight with Mace Windu, right? Yeah. The dark side corrupts. Mm-hmm. He embraces the dark side. And, most importantly, when he's burning alive... Um, and I was thinking about this when I was watching it. If I were, If I were to remake Revenge of the Sith, the one thing that I would change first and foremost would be, I would explain a lot of this in the movie. Like, I would do my best to make sure that this was really clear. Not through exposition, but just through storytelling, visually. Yeah. Yeah. That, um, that this is happening to Padme, that her body is going through this transformation as well, because, it, like, that's why she goes into labor early, that, like, she dies in childbirth, all of that stuff. Anakin, I would have him, when he catches on fire... And Obi-Wan walks away. Obi-Wan leaves. And as soon as Obi-Wan is gone, like, because he leaves because he can't watch this happen, yeah. right? Anakin, in the movie, he just, the flames just go out. Yeah, yeah. There's no explanation for it. They just go out. He just stops burning. Mm-hmm. I would have had, when Palpatine shows up, when Darth Sidious shows up, that he shows up and they instantly find Anakin because he's, like, floating above the lava uh. with, like, a force bubble around him almost like protecting him that's like extinguished the flame and that's keeping him alive but that it's like crackling with dark side energy of like like he has he's tapped in to like the primal dark side in order to stay alive and this is a this is definitely armchair quarterbacking and this is this is for sure but that's hindsight. what happened that's, that's what that's what's happening is that the okay. dark side is keeping him alive. Okay. His his um lust for power and his desire to save Padme still. Yeah. So it is love, but it's a possessive love. Yeah, yeah, it's is yeah. what keeps him alive. Yeah. Cuz he thinks like if I can survive this, I will defeat Palpatine, I'll take over the galaxy, I'll bring peace and justice, I'll bring order, I will do all of the things that I said that I was going to do. Yeah. Right? If I can just hold on, right? Mm-hmm. But what I wanted to see was, like, an unconscious, like, the midichlorians, essentially, taking over and saving his body. Um, and the reason why I think I see that now is because of the Clone Wars, because that's what happens to Darth Maul. Oh. Darth Maul gets cut in half right. and and falls down the reactor shaft or whatever, and, and we know through the story that he gets essentially dumped out with the garbage and ends up on this junk planet... And on that junk planet, he, through sheer will and and desire to get revenge on Obi-Wan Kenobi, survives and creates this spider body oh. from his waist down. No way. And so when we first see him in the Clone Wars, he's got like this mechanical these mechanical like spider legs and abdomen and then and he's insane. Like he's gone completely insane from the dark side. Wow. Um that's cool. Yeah, so like now with that knowledge, I look at that and I go like, we could have done more in this movie to Oh, well, they probably didn't know what they were of doing. Of course, of course. Like I think I think it. that the ideas were there. I just mm-hmm. don't think that they were as Executed. fully formed. Yeah. Um so that's the explanation. The the moment when the mask comes down and and Anakin Skywalker is gone mm-hmm. and Darth Vader replaces him is the moment that that and also the children are removed from from Pad, Padme's body. Now her only connection to the Force is Anakin. These these other two life forces that have their own connections to the Force that are innocent, so mm-hmm. are pure, mm-hmm. not light or dark. They're just pure. Mm-hmm. Um, they have a strong connection to what to what Qui Gon refers to as the Living Force. Like they were probably protecting her up until that point. Mm. They're out of her body. Her only connection is to Anakin Skywalker. Anakin Skywalker dies. She dies. 
Oh, because her body had been manipulated and she was only hanging because on her, because of them. Because oh, her body still has these gotcha, midichlorians gotcha, gotcha, in gotcha, it gotcha, that gotcha. are connected to Anakin Skywalker. So that's a that is however many years. I, I what is it? How how many 16, years has it been? 15. Sixteen years or whatever. Uh-huh. Fifteen years. I uh, fourteen years. Two thousand five. Yeah. yeah. Fourteen years of me thinking about it. Yeah, yeah, and figuring to, out to yeah. get to that point of having it like that well articulated. Right. But. But that is, I am sure that's the logic that George Lucas was running under. Is that like, was that she, like it was Anakin keeping his, her alive? And yeah, so, yeah, yeah. His connection, their connection to each other, his possessiveness of her, the dark side, all of these factors together are what caused her to die. Okay. Um, she also kind of like had given part of herself to him. In their devotion to one another. And yeah. this, this very weird, very codependent, very unhealthy relationship. And I think that's the that's the 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 other part of the prequels that I don't think is focused on enough. And the Clone Wars does it a little bit, but also not enough to my to my liking. Um, there is actually a book that I don't like very much, but there's a little bit of this in it, uh, Thrawn Alliances, that it takes place between um, season three of three and four of Star Wars Rebels and also in the middle of the Clone Wars. So mm-hmm. it connects those two time periods together. Thrawn and Anakin go on a mission together. Grand Admiral Thrawn's a character from the Expanded Universe. Uh, they go on a, a, a mission together and then revenge of the sith happens and 20 years pass or 15 years pass or whatever and then thrawn and vader go on a mission together and at the beginning of the book we don't think that thrawn knows that vader is anakin and we learn of thrawn's a genius that's his character that's really at one point in time that was really his only character trait was that he was smarter than everybody else which is one of the reasons i roll my eyes when i say that because it's a lame character trait is one of those characters that that is like they go, they like later in the in the in the books they're like, oh he knew exactly what Luke was gonna do ten steps ahead of when he did it because he's a genius and the reason we know that is because he plays chess uh-huh. and he's always five moves ahead oh, in yeah, chess right yeah. like I just I hate that trope because it's lazy writing if yeah. you want that to happen show me yeah, yeah show me that he's that smart yeah. explain to me how he came to that conclusion don't just say. He's really good at chess. He's always thinking five moves ahead. Okay. That's why he knows what's going to happen yeah, already. No. No. But um, there's a little bit of the unhealthy relationship between Anakin and Padme in that. But okay. there's not enough of that in the prequels. Right. Well, no. And that's... I will say, like, going back and looking at it, there's... She doesn't do anything in the third movie. Because mm. at least in the second movie... She's, she's a prop. Yeah, at least in the second yeah. movie, she's kind of doing something. Yeah. But the one thing I will give it, and it's a thing that I straight up... Like, was like, how does Obi-Wan not know that yeah. Anakin is the father of this baby? But the flip side of that, because I had to give it the benefit of the doubt, is that they live in such a society that it doesn't matter who the father of her baby is. She's yeah. just living her life and is still yeah. awesome. And, and, and I'm kind of like, okay, that's like one good thing that's coming out of this is that she can just be pregnant and nobody cares. Yeah. There is, like, there, yeah, there uh, is a very weird, completely unintentional yeah. <laughs> evolved like, viewpoint yeah. there, which yeah. is that, like, like I think that George Lucas definitely thought about the fact that, like, she's pregnant. She's not doing the best job hiding the fact that yeah, she's pregnant, no, no. but, like, she's still a senator, and she's still, like, around people, um, but it's never a question of who's the father. Yeah. No, but, until... Yeah. Until Obi Wan clues in of like Anakin is the father, right? Mm-hmm. And it's um, we talked about this last week when we talked about the Clone Wars storyline of how Obi Wan's like relationship parallels, yeah, 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 yeah. and that's where there are there are moments in Clone Wars where both actually there's, there are moments in Clone Wars where where Obi Wan implies that he understands that Anakin and Padme have a romantic relationship. I don't think he understands the depth to which they have a romantic relationship i don't think he knows that they're married Mm. i don't think like he but he understands that there is a connection between those two that is deeper than friendship or admiration or even like like a like a romantic love like it's like it's a very very deep 
connection between the two of them, a very unhealthy one. Mm. And he turns a blind eye to it because he sees his relationship with Satine right. and the opportunity that he didn't take. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so he goes, kind of, yeah, we're in the middle of a war. Anakin is different from other Jedi. If, you were supposed to be different. Yeah. If, if, if what does he call him? The chosen one? What does he, he calls him? Yeah. yeah you were, you the were chosen, chosen one. one. You were my brother. You were my brother. Yeah. Yeah. You were, you were the chosen one. Yeah. yeah. Um, Harry Potter. Hashtag. I, <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and so like, I think like up until that point, he's kind of going like, this isn't like, it's, it, I think he's in a little bit of denial as well. Yeah. I think he's kind of like, it's not as bad as I think it is. Yeah. yeah. Anakin's a good man. It's not yeah. as bad as I think it is. If it, I think the other part is his trust is like, if there were something more going on here, I think Anakin would tell me. Yeah. I hope Anakin would tell me. Yeah. Right? And so I think that's why why Obi-Wan sees that as such a betrayal. Yeah. I also wish that they would have done a better job of... Because especially on this last viewing, I noticed Obi-Wan's on the, on the shore and Anakin's mm-hmm. on the floating platform. And he's like, don't do it. Yeah, don't, don't try don't. it. Yeah. yeah. I have the high ground, which yeah. is now a joke. And then Anakin jumps and he does the thing. And in the next scene, there's no transition. No. There's no moment of, like, realization. We just go from don't do it to full-on weeping, like, gnashing of teeth sort of grief. And that's a result of the way that George Lucas directed everything of, like, just do a bunch of takes and I'll put it together in the editing room. Um, And his sort of assembly line approach to directing actors. Um I wish that there was more there. And and there is because of the Clone Wars. There's also um in Forces of Destiny, uh, Ahsoka, there's a short that that um that involves Anakin, Padme and Ahsoka where Ahsoka realizes that Anakin and Padme are together. Yeah. And she doesn't say anything about it. Hey. She actually kind of says to Anakin, "I approve." Oh, interesting. Like he, okay. she kind of like like they because they were supposed to go off on a mission together and then ahsoka tags along at the last second they get into some trouble and the ship kind of goes haywire and anakin leaps to protect padme um even though padme can take care of herself and she kind of sees this and goes like "Mm, yeah yeah, like you've forgotten that i'm even here yeah yeah. um and then when they get off the ship uh, uh, ahsoka goes you know, I'm going to hold back and I'm going to fix the ship while you guys, you guys go do your thing and sort of like, like gives them it's kind like, of the wink of like, right. I know yeah, and I'm okay with it. Anything, yeah. Um, All I could, yeah. And then, yeah. and then watching Revenge, Re- Revenge of the Sith after having watched, this is the first time I've watched it since the end of Star Wars Rebels. Mm. Not since the end of, of Clone Wars, but there's so much more of Ahsoka in Star Wars Rebels. Um, and there's so much more of Anakin and Ahsoka, Vader and Ahsoka, like the them confronting one another. Oh no way! I didn't in know that go. they they it was my perspective this time was very much. It's something that I've said a lot on the podcast, but it's that Anakin's actions didn't make sense when all we had was Attack of the Clones, the Clone Wars micro series, and then Revenge of the Sith. Which when Revenge of the Sith came out, that's all we had in some books. Yeah. Now that we have the Clone Wars and Star Wars Rebels, and you look at the relationship that Anakin had with Ahsoka, what happened with Ahsoka, the fact that she left, and we're going to get the last season of Clone Wars, finally, this of this Clone fall. Wars or... Yeah, they're coming back and doing finally doing the last season. Because it got cut short when the Disney buyout happened, oh. so they're gonna they're gonna finish the series with the most important storyline, which is Ahsoka's last story during the Clone Wars, which actually happens during Revenge of the Sith during oh, no Order sixty six. Oh wow! Yeah, that's so cool. Yeah, and the last time that Anakin and Ahsoka see each other, so they the the last time that they had seen each other, as far as we knew before this, was when Ahsoka left the Jedi Order, and she's like she. Anakin was like, you don't have to do this. We can fix this. We can, like, because they accused her of trying to bomb the Senate Mm -hmm. because the Separatists were framing her. Right, yeah. Um, And no, none of the Jedi stuck by her. Mm -hmm. They had a tribunal and they let the Republic come in and make it murky. And, like, it got really complicated. And it was, like, the story sort of is exemplifying how 
messed up the, the Jedi, Jedi Order were, is yeah, and how yeah. corrupted they've become yeah. with their position of power and their involvement with the Republic that they've lost their own ethical base. Right. Um, and that they're not trusting their instincts. They're they're listening to the Republic and not to Which their Which feeds own. into what you said that that makes us such a stronger like yeah. impetus for... For... for, for Anakin yeah, to, to I was turn call him Kylo. Yeah, to <laughs> turn on Anakin. Same okay. thing. Yeah, yeah. Um so so she says I've had enough of this. And because she's Anakin's Padawan, right? Like she's learned this independence from him into question, which he learned in turn from Obi-Wan, who learned it in turn from from Qui-Gon, who learned it in turn from Dooku. <laughs> right? So there's like this lineage yeah. of, of of teachers um where it kind of goes through them and and she says like like they 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 cast judgment on me and like none of them stood by me except for you. I don't want to be a part of the Jedi Order anymore. I'm turning my back on it, which is, as we talked about last week, as, as a foil for uh, for Anakin's character. That's what Anakin should have done. Right, Anakin should have looked at the Jedi Order and seen there's corruption here. You're not making the right decisions. I am different from other Jedi. I want to be different from other Jedi. I'm leaving the Jedi Order. That's what he should have done at the beginning of this movie. Mm -hmm. Padme goes, I'm pregnant. Yeah, he This goes, is complicated. And yeah. he and they go, yeah, maybe we'll maintain maybe, the yeah. secret for a little while longer. Let's see let's see how long we can get away with this one. Yeah. It's like eventually you guys gotta come out with the truth, yeah. right? But what they should have both done was in that moment gone, are we both happy about this? Is this the life that we want to live? Do we want to raise this child? together as a family and give this child like the best possible future then yeah leave you the leave the jedi order i will step down from the senate and we'll go to Naboo. we'll we'll do this for a little bit and then we can come back to our lives like yeah. like you maybe you can't come back to being a jedi but you can be like like in context now with with ahsoka and her storyline it's like go be whatever Ahsoka is. She's yeah. not a Jedi anymore. But so like the last time, now we know that the last time that they see each other is literally right before Anakin and Obi-Wan leave to save the Chancellor. Oh, no way. Yeah. And oh, he, wow. Anakin gives essentially his battalion, um, like a, a huge contingent of the 501st, including Captain Rex to Ahsoka to go fight the siege of Mandalore because Darth Maul has retaken Mandalore and now, Ahsoka and uh, and and the clone troopers have to go. There's so much that happens outside of the main movies. I know none of this. And it's stuff. better. Yeah. The Clone Wars is better than the prequels. It's wow. so much better yeah. than the prequels. And stuff actually happens. It yeah. sounds so like. Yeah. It's anyways, it's, yeah. it's it, it, like these stories are great, and I can't wait for this to finish. And and we've seen the scene like they showed us at Star Wars Celebration, the scene between Anakin and Ahsoka, and it's a tearjerker. Like uh -huh. like it's this moment of of. Like, she was gone, she left the Jedi Order, and Anakin could be very, like, spiteful or vindictive about it, but he's not. He's, he's like, very, like, he's magnanimous about it. He's very, like, you had to do your thing, and I respect you for that, and you've grown into an amazing woman, and, um, and, and you're a better Jedi than I'll ever be, and, like, all that sort of thing. And he's, like, and, and these guys, like, the clones agree with me. Like, Captain Rex and all these mm -hmm. guys agree with me, and that's why they all want to go with you. And then they all put on these helmets that have... She has, like, these tattoos. Yeah, yeah, Like, the so, markings yeah, yeah, that the, 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 yeah. the, the Togruta have. And they've all... Put that on put their Put that helmets. on their oh, helmets. Cute. As, like, to signify that they're not Anakin's clone troopers. They're her clone troopers. And she's not even a Jedi anymore. So she, she's not a Padawan. So she's not a commander anymore. She's this other thing that's just coming in yeah. to help with this battle. And they all go, like, no, we're, like, oh, you have our loyalty. Wow, that's so cool. <laughs> through action, not through rank. And then we find out, we you don't know yet because you have to watch the show, but we don't know how she survives Order 66? We, we know enough. To know yeah. how she survived because Order of 66 because of other stuff. When the series wasn't going to finish, when mm -hmm. it wasn't going to get its ending, Dave Filoni did panels and talked a lot about it oh, and okay. sort of went through. Like, there was a. Uh, actually, I was in the room for this panel at Star Wars Celebration uh, uh, Anaheim where they, they showed a lot of stuff and showed a lot of the storylines that cool. they were going to do um, and showed her in her non Jedi outfit and like. So we've seen a lot of it, um, and we know that a lot of it has to do with Captain Rex, um, and the fact that he 
the clones all have like this biological chip in their brains mm-hmm. that they were engineered with that when they hear order 66 they turn on the jedi right yeah another clone trooper named fives uncovered this oh okay and ripped it out of his head but it made him go crazy oh, I like see. It, because he he like literally like ripped it out of his head right, he yeah. wasn't they weren't he wasn't careful about yeah, it yeah yeah so it like Actually, it eventually yeah. drove him kind of insane and he uh he kind of lost it and then like died like he mm-hmm. basically like hemorrhaged in the brain mm-hmm. and died but right before he does he tells rex all of this okay. and so it's implied that at some point between that and order 66 rex goes and Takes has this thing removed, removed from his head Interesting. um so when order 66 happens he doesn't turn we know a lot of this already it's not spoilers because rex is in star wars rebels so, oh, right. So it's like you. Yeah. So we can we know like he remains a good guy. He maintains like he, he keeps right, his yeah. personality. Cool. And that explains why like Captain Cody is like, or Commander Cody is like, I'm going to kill Obi-Wan now. Like five seconds ago, I was handing him his lightsaber because he's my best friend. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. and then Palpatine's like execute order 66 and I'm like, kill a Jedi. Right. Yeah, right? Yeah, like yeah. that's what explains that. So. Right. Is that yeah. Is, yeah. No, that makes sense. Um, so yeah. Revenge of the Sith. Way too much action, not enough story, um, but that was my feeling coming out of the movie the first time that I saw it. Yeah. I, I watched it, and it was the first of the prequels that I walked out of, and I went, I don't know if that was a good movie. Hmm. I know I enjoyed myself. I know that there was a lot of stuff in that that I really liked, but Order 60, there's too much in Revenge of the Sith for one story. Yeah. There's just too much. There's too much going on to the point where a lot of the characters just aren't serviced. Padme has a whole storyline that was filmed that's in deleted scenes where she meets with Mon Mothma and Bail Organa and they're essentially forming the rebellion, but within the Senate. And that's where the scene where Anakin says you're starting to sound like a separatist. All right, it's like It's supposed to like you're supposed to like play that against that scene where they literally say in that in that conversation, they're like, guys, this is the same conversation that the separatists were having five years ago. Yeah, and like... Are they right? Yeah. Okay. Were they right? And it's like, well, no, they wanted to separate because the techno union and the trade federation they didn't want right they were libertarians that didn't want to be regulated it's not about morals yeah yeah. they wanted to deregulate banks so that they could cause subprime mortgage crises (laughs) across the galaxy and profit from it right that's what they wanted to do the the separatist agenda was different but all, all of these systems that have allied with the separatists this is what the thing that we're worried about happening in the in the senate right now that's what they were worried about too. That's why yeah. they joined with the Separatist, Separatist Alliance. Yeah. yeah, and so they're essentially forming the rebellion, yeah, a, an opposition like coalition sort of thing within the Senate, and that's all cut out of the movie. And it's like, okay, good, but also like now Padme is a prop yeah. with babies in her. Yeah. Right. And we're just waiting for her to die because she's supposed to. Yeah. Although it's in direct contradiction to lines in Return of the Jedi where where Leia says that she knew her mother. mother. Yeah, exactly. So. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So Revenge of the Sith, the best prequel. Yes. But still not going to rank that high in the other Star Wars movies, I don't think. No. For us. For me, definitely. So the official ranking right now with no contest, no argument is Revenge of the Sith. Attack of the Clones, The Phantom Menace. Yes. Okay. Which I don't think is... Is that what uh, Brad's is too? Uh, no, his... his is all over the place. No so, way. So let me go let back me to bring so Go back his. to where we were at the beginning. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I'm excited to, to watch A New Hope for this conversation uh, soon. But here's, here's his ranking. Uh, starting at number eleven, so he included Whoa. he included all of the theatrical releases. Remember, for our ranking, we're doing the nine mm-hmm. Skywalker saga yeah. stories. So Solo, Rogue One, and the Clone Wars movie are not counted in our ranking, yeah. but he's included them in his. So eleven is the Clone Wars film. I agree with that. <laughs> That's legit. And then he's got the Last Jedi. What? Yeah, we're no longer friends, Brad. And then the Phantom Menace. What? How? We're not friends. <laughs> and then Rogue One at number eight. Interesting. Uh, Attack of the Clones at number seven. 
Revenge of the Sith at number six. So if if we like Last Jedi aside, because it's not going to end up being our worst mm-hmm. ranked. Yes, Phantom Menace, then Attack, and then Revenge. yeah. So that's right. Yeah. So yeah, and then he's got Solo at number five, which is respectable. The Force Awakens at number four, Return of the Jedi, A New Hope, Empire Strikes Back. Interesting. Other than the placement of Last Jedi, which I, Brad, we're gonna have to have words. <laughs> I, 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 I think that his his ranking is pretty good. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I yeah. mean, it, it makes sense. It's just I'd I'd be really curious to see why the Last Jedi is there because yeah. it just seems really incongruous with. I mean, I hope that it's like it's like um. Like trilogy, like that that like thing where like you can't really tell where it's going, and therefore it doesn't mean as much think, until you watch. I the think third Skywalker one. will fix, fix a whole bunch of stuff. a lot of people's opinions. Okay, so uh, that was our three first episodes of of uh, the Thundercrack podcast. Uh, like we talked about before, we're we're gonna do three episodes on, take a break, and then come back. So uh, there will be no new episode next week, uh, but the week after we'll be back. Um, with another kind of late posting episode because we're recording these on Tuesday. Yeah. Um, we tried really hard to keep it on Monday. Yeah, but, but then we'll go back to Monday yeah, yeah. Uh, the week after that. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so the next one that we'll rank is A New Hope. Which I realize I have to now watch while I'm on vacation. When yeah. I go away. So it's I just had to watch The Force Awakens instead of A New Hope. I could have watched both A New Hope and Return sure. I feel like, anyways. Um, yeah, cool. Well, I, I, I mean, one thing that you can do is you can watch Rogue One and A New Hope back to back. Yeah. I feel like I have to, like, yeah. I think I might, yeah. I, even though Rogue One's not in our ranking, just because, although, I mean, like, it's so difficult for me. I have no time to do this. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it would be cool to, maybe, maybe I'll just watch the third act of Rogue One. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't yeah, really yeah, like the rest cool, of that yeah, movie. Yeah. But I'll watch the third act of Rogue One and then go right into A New Hope. Um. Yeah, uh, context on that one's going to change a lot too because of Rogue One, because of Star Wars Rebels. So, uh, Interesting. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm excited. Is Star Wars Rebels before A New Hope? Yeah. Star Wars Rebels, it goes solo, Star Wars Rebels, Rogue One, A New Hope. Nice. That's sort of, they're kind of almost, yeah. almost continuous. Rebels doesn't quite go back five years. It's four seasons, and I think it's meant to take place over around three years. Okay. But it... Star Wars Rebels basically leads up to um to Rogue One. It doesn't tie in directly, but it there are some there there's a lot in Star Wars Rebels about this this I uh, I uh, whatever the empire is up to. Oh. And they're after they're they're trying to find giant kyber crystals. So oh, what, I don't know what, what they're, they're doing, doing with those, gotcha, but yeah. Yeah, but obviously that has to do with the Death Star. Forrest Whitaker's character is in... Star Wars Rebels. Star Wars Rebels, yeah. yeah. He okay, appears yeah. in two episodes. Yeah. yeah. Two right. episodes? Yeah, I think so. Cool. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. man. They're all, it's cool that they're all connected. Look at this grandiose storytelling. Yeah. Gotta love this world. Uh, cool. Well, that's it for the Thunderquack podcast this week. Uh, thank you guys for listening. As always... Uh, nope. Not as always. You, there's you, nothing There's you nothing to... Stay up to, to stay date up to date the lowest. Um, the you can head to Thunderquack dot com to check out all the other great podcasts in the network you can also follow us on facebook at facebook.com slash thunderquack on twitter at thunderquack net and on instagram at thunderquack podcast you can also follow us individually i'm at a conkin a k-o-n-k-i-n uh, on twitter and you can add an 86 to that for instagram and i'm on twitter and instagram at arkwolf a-r-k-w-u-l-f uh, and if you like what you hear, you can support us in two ways. First, by going to store.thunderquack.com to pick up some merchandise. Um, and second, by going to patreon.com slash thunderquack to, uh, to chip in your monthly support. A dollar gets you uh, early access to the Thunderquack podcast, as well as access to the Facebook group. I was going to do that Discord thing, and then I looked into what Discord is, and it's kind of for video gaming. Oh, interesting. It's like a, it's like a, it's like a chat, like a, like a oh. gaming chat. So I okay. think it's like meant for like, like voice. Specifically for that. Oh, chatting. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it doesn't really, it doesn't really fit with our audience. Yeah, so, yeah. so we're not going to do that. Um, I, anything else that the $1 tier gets? I'm trying to remember. I think that's basically it. I, of course, if you want the full uncut episode of uh, of the Thunderquack podcast every Tuesday. You can get that at the $5 tier where you also get access to everything else 
but um, you you also get the MP3 versions of our YouTube content, um, as well as you get early access to um, to great uh, comic creator interviews over on the Epic Marvel podcast, which is something that I don't really talk about a lot, but that's something that that Curtis does. Um, you basically get those a week early, so nice. um, yeah, those are great. Great, that's great content that, that he does over there, talking to lots of um, really interesting, great uh, comic creators from from the history of Marvel Comics. Um, so if you want to learn more about Marvel Comics, that's the that's one of the best ways to do it. Uh, yeah, so uh, patreon.com slash thunderquack to get all that stuff um, and more at higher tiers. Uh, go check it out. Um, it's June, which is the end of... No, is it... was. It's the end of the second quarter, right? No, July is the end of. I don't Q2. know what you, how you're. Yeah. If if we go by quarters of the year, so we have January, okay, yeah. February, March, April, May, June. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's the end of the second quarter, which means Ooh, that the quarterly the, comes the out. quarterly will come out yeah. in June. So, yeah. um, which means I have to do it. I uh, so if you are, I if you are at one of those tiers, either the ten dollar, yeah, it's the ten dollar or twenty dollar tier. Um, you're going to get a survey in the next week or two, uh, where I'm going to give you guys some options of what, uh, of what I'm going to draw and, uh, and you guys can pick, uh, the, the piece of artwork for the first Thunderquack quarterly. And, uh, do you want to write the thing? Do you want to write, oh, write something I for it? I can write something yeah. for it. Okay. Yeah, that'd be cool. fun. Um, cool. Well, uh, yeah, so that's going to come at the end of this month. So if you want to get that, make sure that you're at that tier this month mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. and you'll get the the thundercrack quarterly that's a nice way to game uh, the system <laughs> it is for sure um cool uh it's also a great way for us to trick people into spending an extra five dollars <laughs> yeah. or 15 yeah um or in some instances 19 <laughs> yeah. um and remember you'll get that so at the 20 dollar level you get the physical copy that i'll mail to you mm -hmm. Um, that you can put into a frame or into a buy however you want to collect that you can collect that mm -hmm. um ten dollar level you get the digital version of it and if you want to print that off yourself you can um either way it's exclusive to those tiers and the full artwork will not be released anywhere else mm -hmm. um i'll release a teaser of it because we want to get people Excited feeling like they missed out yeah. mm -hmm. but um yeah i i but remember that you also you get everything else as well mm -hmm. everything else that i just mentioned from the five dollar yeah. tier so uh yeah Cool. Um, so if you want to support us, uh, patreon.com slash thunderquack. Uh, that's it for this week. That's it for the prequels. Yeah. So we'll be back in two weeks uh, to rank Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope. Mm -hmm. May the Force be with you. <laughs> <laughs>